Thank you everyone for joining us today for the uh, PIMS Marston uh, Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, and um, uh, we're very happy to have uh, our distinguished speaker, Professor Melvin Liag uh, from UC San Diego. Now, before uh, we introduce, uh, for introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to say a few words about this lecture series. So the Marston Memorial uh, Lecture Series was created uh, by PIMS and dedicated to the memory of uh, Gerald Marston, who was a professor at Caltech, and he was a world-renowned Canadian applied mathematician. Uh, the first lecture in this, in this series happened in Vancouver in 2011, a year after uh, Marston's uh, passing, and we're very happy to be hosting the eighth lecture in this series. So I'll ask my uh, colleague Andy to uh, introduce the speaker and then we'll start. Uh, thank you, Aliyah, and thank you, Melvin, for joining us. So I'll just give a very brief uh, uh, introduction to Melvin here. I'm Professor Melvin Leoc is a professor at mathematics at the University of California, San Diego. He received his PhD in 2004 uh, from Caltech in control and dynamical systems under Gerald Maston. Uh, he's a, a Simmons uh, Fellow in mathematics, three-time NAS Kavlin, Kavli Frontier of Science Fellow, DOD Newton Award, NSF Early Career Development Award, Psyche New Talent Prize, and Leslie Fox Second Prize in Miracle Analysis. Uh, his research interests are in computational geometric mechanics and control theory, discrete differential geometry, and structure preserving numerical methods. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Melvin Leon to give this uh, memorial lecture. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's uh, in honor of uh, Jerry Marsden, who was my advisor. And uh, you might or might not know that Jerry was born in British Columbia, Ocean Falls, 1942, uh, which was a small uh, woodmill town. So um, in a similar industry, it's like to what uh, Prince George is involved in. And uh, he received his bachelor's at the University of Toronto, PhD at Princeton, uh, he was at Berkeley for many years, it's like before he moved to Caltech, and he was the founding director of the uh, Fields Institute, um, which is now at the University of Toronto. Um, so he works in geometric mechanics, dynamical systems, control team. So, uh, so this is a talk which is dedicated to his honor and his memory. <clears throat> so, so let me say a little bit about uh, what I'll be talking about. Um, um, so this is uh, joint work with uh, a current graduate student, Valentin Dorisu, uh, former student Jeremy Schmidt and uh, a collaborator Jin Zhang, who's a professor of uh, mathematical psychology at the University of Michigan, very generously funded. It's like uh, over many years. It's like by the National Science Foundation, DoD, um, the Air Force Office of uh, Scientific Research, and uh, more recently the, by the Simons Foundation. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, it's like Jerry has been very influential in my life. It's uh, you know, it's, I was. Start working with him as undergraduate when I was at Caltech, stayed on to do a PhD of him, uh, and it's been a great advisor, mentor, role model, collaborator, colleague, and friend. Um, <clears throat> so um, while he was at Caltech, it's like uh, since 2000, uh, he advised 24 PhD students, of whom 10 of them were in this broad area of uh, discrete geometry and mechanics. Uh, and uh, I was able to dig up an old photo. It's like back when we graduated um, of a few of us, it's like uh, at a reception. Okay, so, so let me try to start by giving you a flavor for what geometric mechanics is and how Thank geometry you. plays a role. Um, yeah, how geometry plays a role uh, in uh, various mechanical problems, control problems, uh, before going on to the main topic of, of my lecture. So, so what we have here is uh, the fallen cat. If you take a cat by its legs upside down and you dropped it, um, then you might know that cats have a reputation always landing on their feet. Um, uh, so not a real cat, clearly. It's, uh, it's actually a Mercedes-Benz commercial. Um, <clears throat> but um, the cat's able to do this, it's like by changing its shape. And, and so there's this uh, interesting non-trivial coupling it's like between the shape dynamics and group dynamics of this. Uh, and in some sense, reduction theory is all about uh, understanding it's like the interrelationship and things like geometric control theory um, aims to leverage uh, those type of connections. So let me give you an intuition for where the geometry comes in uh, and what the essential mathematical aspects of this are, okay? So, um, so this 
idea of the cat being able to rotate is an example of what is known as geometric phase, uh, which is an example of holonomy. It's, uh, and um, so you can think of curvature in particular as uh, infinitesimal holonomy. Um, so let me try to illustrate um, this with an analogy. So if you, if you take your thumb and you point it out and you try to just sweep it out uh, in a triangle, okay, and come back, you'll see that my thumb has rotated, right? So I start pointing up, just do the obvious thing as I move around and I come back and it's rotated by an amount. And that amount by which it's rotated is what is known as a holonomy. Um, and uh, it's exactly related to the amount of curvature uh, which is enclosed that's like in that loop which you have there. Okay, so this is an example here. Uh, you take a frame, it's like on the surface of the sphere, you transport it, it's like around a spherical triangle, and you'll see that as you move around, it rotates, okay? So how is that related to the cat? You can think of the shape of the cat as being a point on the surface of the sphere. It's called shape space. Um, and you can think of the orientation of the cat in free space as being related to what that vector on the, on the plane is, or on the sphere is. Um, and as you change your shape and you come back to your original shape, because the region which you've enclosed has some sort of non-trivial curvature to it, the, uh, the cat basically reorients itself. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, essence, if you will, it's like of the problem. Uh, and of course, if you were to try to do parallel transport on a flat surface, then nothing happens, reflecting the fact that you're enclosing a region with no curvature. Okay, um, other examples of holonomy are so there's this beautiful uh, double spiral staircase in the Vatican Museum. And the idea then again is that if you think of the projected motion onto the plane as being um, in a circle, but you're constrained to lie on this spherical, uh, on this uh, spiral staircase, right? And what happens is that you translate in the Z direction as well. So that's another example of holonomy, if you will. Okay, so what is all this useful for? And I think one of the things I think Jerry was uh, unusual in was his ability to connect beautiful mathematics with useful applications, okay? And um, so, so the basic idea here is that these examples of geometric phase and uh, shape, if you will, control uh, are important when you're doing uh, things like trying to control the attitude of say the Hubble Space Telescope, um, because what happens is that if you're out in space and you try to turn on thrusters, it's like to reorient the spacecraft, you impart angular momentum to the spacecraft, but because you're out in space, there's no dissipation. So you have to exactly cancel that angular momentum which you impart in order to make sure that you're stationary and pointing at the object which you want. So that's extremely difficult to do, right? Because unfortunately it's like when you turn on thrusters, they don't come on, it's like just like that. There's a little bit of a ramp up and ramp down time. So it's ex very difficult to exactly cancel this out. So what you should do instead, if you're trying to reorient uh, a satellite, in particular a satellite, which is being used for imaging purposes, right? Is to use these kind of geometric phase type ideas. You want to rotate momentum wheels. And as the momentum wheel rotates, because of the conservation of angular momentum, the outer shell will rotate as well. The moment you stop turning the momentum wheels, it stops rotating. Okay, so there's a beautiful simulation of this uh, by um, Sigrid Leidecker and Sina Obo-Boblam, uh, amongst others, um, which shows exactly this phenomena where you have this cubicle model of, of a spacecraft and these momentum wheels which are rotating. And you'll see that um, the moment you stop, I mean, when you start rotating, the um, container rotates as well. And the moment you stop rotating the momentum wheels, the whole thing stops, okay? So that's just an example of how Geometric ideas, right, relate to things like control. Okay, so one of the things I've been interested uh, in for many years is this interaction between geometry, conservation laws, and numerical methods, okay? So let me try to give you an indication of some of the kind of geometric invariants which are relevant when you're studying dynamical systems. So in uh, many systems of interest, um, they have, um, many of them have, um, basically invariants or conservation laws. Um, and examples of these include uh, things like the energy. Um, there's this close connection between uh, symmetries and the preservation of momenta. Um, so if you have uh, a system which is translationally invariant, for example, the, angular, uh, the linear momentum is preserved. You have something which is rotationally uh, invariant, the angular momentum is preserved. 
uh, if you have a fluid and there's what's called the particle relabeling symmetry, which more or less means you don't care, it's like how you choose to label the particles, uh, then that leads to a deep conservation law, which is called the Kelvin circulation theorem, which says that if you take a loop in the fluid and you infect this uh, loop, it's like by the flow, then the circulation, which is enclosed in that transported loop, uh, stays a constant. Okay. Um, if you've uh, ever worked with Hamiltonian systems, it's like then you know of uh, what is called the symplectic form. It's more or less um, it in, the conservation of symplecticity implies uh, it's volume preserving, but it's a stronger condition than that. Uh, other times, it's like uh, they're they're what are called integrable systems, and you can ask whether you can discretize an integrable system and then have it be discretely integrable as well. Okay, so those are just some examples of invariance. Other times, the equations themselves move on curved spaces. Um, so as an example, if you were to take an object and you want to rotate it, then one very natural way to represent that mathematically is to pick a reference uh, state of the system and then choose um, you know, to represent all other configurations with respect to that reference state uh, through something like a rotation matrix, okay? So given a reference state and a rotation matrix, you can tell what, or you can describe what the current state of the system is. Okay, so if you want to model something like this on a computer, what are the challenges to doing that? Well, one of the main challenges is that if you take rotation matrices and you add them together, which is what you typically do uh, in numerical methods, you tend to add things together. Um, well, you no longer stay in the space of rotations. Okay, so what that's really telling you is that the space of rotations is curved in some way, shape or form. Um, and so that's really the question uh, underlying many of these methods, how do you respect the fact that the spaces, the abstract spaces you move in or you um, which describe the dynamics are curved? How do you stay on them uh, when you're trying to implement all these things on the computer, okay? All right, um, so the main goal, if you will, it's like of what is called geometric integration then is to preserve structure and the payoff it's like you get when you preserve structure is that you get typically much better long-time behavior uh, of the system. And um, so essentially what's happening is that um, these structure preserving methods have a discrete conservation law. They preserve some sort of discrete invariant and this discrete invariant is close to the continuous invariant you care about. And as a consequence of that, you always stay close to the continuous thing you care about. So let me try to illustrate this idea. So um, if you've ever worked with uh, integrators from mechanical systems, uh, you might have heard the term symplectic integrators, and, and maybe you might not have, but in any case, the basic idea behind symplectic integrators uh, is that, uh, well, they don't exactly preserve the energy. So the, if you think of this green, I'm very bad at pointing this, sorry. Uh, if you think of this uh, green line here as being the energy uh, isosurface, which is uh, describing what the real system is doing, and that wiggly orange line as being the discrete energy which the numerical method is preserving, then basically what happens is that if you stay on this uh, sort of wiggly isosurface, which is the consequence of the discrete conservation law, then you will stay close to the actual energy surface which you care about, okay? So this is a way of proving long time stability, which is very difficult to do with traditional methods. And so let me say um, now that the, you know, the proof or the pudding is in the eating. So let's look at an example and let's see what the consequences of preserving structure is, okay? So if you have a differential equation, x dot is equal to f of x, then you might've heard of the Euler method, okay? And what the Euler method does is to say that the solution at the new time is equal to the solution at old time plus h times the vector field at the old time, okay? So that's exactly what's happening here. Qk plus one is equal to Qk plus h times Q dot evaluated at the old time, okay? Um, so if you know something about numerical methods and you know that Ford Euler is, is easy to analyze, but it's uh, um, conditionally stable, which more or less means that if you take too large a time step, you get garbage, okay? So uh, instead of that, there is what's called inverse Euler where it looks essentially the same, um, but the difference is that um, you're evaluating the vector field now at the new time, okay? Then there's this strange beast at the very bottom, which is called symplectic Euler, um, where you evaluate the vector field at the initial position and the final momentum. Okay, well, okay. So that seems a bit, a bit funky, but let's see what happens uh, and uh, when you actually use this. 
Okay, so if you were to use Oil Euler um, and simulate a n-body uh, model of the solar system, you'll see that after a little bit, it's like one of the planets got voted off the island. Okay, so not a good result. Okay, so, you know, and again, if you know something about numerical analysis, you might think, well, that's because it's, uh, you know, conditionally stable, maybe I took too big a time step. So let's see what happens with uh, inverse Euler, which is unconditionally stable. And you'll see again, it's like, um, you know, it's like one of the inner planets is like spiraled too close to the sun and got ejected out. Okay, so so that ejection really is sort of a numerical uh, issue there. Okay, all right. So so let's see what happens with symplectic Euler, and you'll see that symplectic Euler does a really beautiful job of uh, you know reconstructing it's like the uh, the orbits of this n-body problem. So this is not to say that the solar system is stable, but over the time scales of this problem, which is about two hundred years it is relatively stable, okay? And you'll see that uh, it does a really good job of uh, having, you know, it's like these small energy error oscillations as opposed to the other two methods which have these large energy errors, okay? So hopefully that gives you at least a sense that, you know, maybe there's something to this idea of preserving geometric structure when you're trying to simulate things over very long times, okay? And I should say that the cost of, you know, implementing all these methods are roughly comparable. I mean, symplectic Euler is a little bit more expensive, but it's not more expensive than implicit Euler. Okay. All right. So, so now let me go on and like to the main sort of topic of my, uh, of my talk, which is how do you connect discrete mechanics, right, with uh, optimization and, and uh, machine learning? And, and the other question is, well, why, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so the basic idea is that in many physical problems which you care about, imagine you have a bunch of drones and you want to collect data, it's like about the, the world around you, okay? So in those problems, there's the combination of two factors, right? There's the information theoretic level, each drone is collecting information, digital information about the world. And then it's like, that's the fact that those sensors which are on the drones are physically moving. And there's as a consequence of that, there is some sort of natural dynamics there, okay? So, so you can think of this as some sort of uh, you know, information mechanical system, and you want to ask, well, how do you optimize both the physical task of moving sensors around, as well as the information theoretic task of trying to maximize the amount of information you collect, okay? So usually it's like when you try to address these type of problems, um, you typically optimize them sequentially. What I mean by that is that usually you, you start with the, uh, at the top level, you start with the information theoretic task of trying to figure out, well, where should I go to optimize the amount of information I get? Imagine that I have, you know, very high, it's like, you know, um, so should we say confidence? It's like in the quality of the data I have in a particular region, but maybe less confidence, it's like somewhere else, right? So it's natural in that situation to, you know, preferentially move some of your drones, it's like to the region, where you're less certain about, okay? So once you've done that, once you've set out the task which maximizes or say minimizes the uncertainty, it's like uh, of the information you get, then it's like there's the task of taking those drones and actually moving them to that location, right? So the optimization is done sequentially. You first choose, you know, it's like to move the drones based on the information theoretic part of the optimization problem. And then once you've decided where to move the drones, you try to do that as cheaply as possible, okay? So the problem with that, if you will, uh, is that uh, oftentimes that only really makes sense when there's a separation of scales in the problem. Somehow that the physics is fast enough that you can ignore it when you are trying to do the optimization uh, at the information level, okay? So, so I'll, I'll go back to this thing, but um, so the, the, the point, if you will, is that we're going to use ideas from information geometry and discrete mechanics um, in order to then provide a unified treatment of this problem, okay? So, uh, and the motivation again is that you have these little tiny drones, it's like, which are very common these days, um, and you want to deploy them, it's like, say, in a building uh, to achieve some sort of reconnaissance, it's like a mission and the problem with doing this uh, in a contested environment is that the easiest way to disable a drone is to throw something like a blanket on it, okay? So, uh, so what you need to do, what a drone needs to do, it's like in order to evade those type of countermeasures is to fly very, very fast. It's like through the building. And imagine it's flying and zipping past, it's like 
the hallway, it sees an open door, it's like it collects all this information, and then it decides that it needs to act on that, right? So because of the fact that it's moving so fast at the limits of its physical capabilities, all right, and it's the new information which is coming in is at that time scale. If it needs to react to that, it needs to, you know, it's like change its course um, at a point where the physics of the problem is a limiting factor. So this separation of scales assumption breaks down, right? So the bottom line again is that in many practical applications, you do care about the information layer and the physical limitations. It's like of your um, of your drones, and you ideally want to be able to optimize this concurrently. Um, and in order to do that, you need to put both of those optimization problems on equal footing. So typically, the optimization problem at the information theoretic level is in discrete time, and then the physical model is in continuous time. So you either need to put both of them in continuous time or both in discrete time, so that you can combine those two optimization problems. So that's sort of the essence of this. All right. So let me give you a sense of some of the uh, the players in the game. It's like what are some of the uh, the mathematical uh, concepts which come into play. Uh, the first of which is what is called uh, information geometry. So it involves the use of differential geometric tools to describe the manifold of probability density functions. So in many problems in machine learning, right, what you want to do is you want to describe a probability measure, it's like in the space of possible outcomes, right? So you might want to say, well, this outcome is more likely, this outcome is less likely, uh, and you want to be able to update that, right? So this is sort of this Bayesian view, it's like of the world, okay? And um, usually it's like what happens in those situations is that you have these uh, parametric models, it's like of these probability density functions. And, you know, it's like, and you might want to ask, you know, it's like many natural geometric questions about that. Right? How close are two probability distributions? Right? How do you get from one to the other as efficiently as possible? Well, what does this all mean? Right? And, and usually when you have a parametric family, right, what that basically means is that there are a bunch of numbers which you know, specify it's like an element of this family. And when you want to take distances it's like between two elements of that family, it's very natural to just use the Euclidean distances and the geometry of Euclidean space which is, um, shall we say, induced by this choice of parameterization to talk about distances, okay? But the problem, of course, is that that notion of distance isn't necessarily the right one. And it isn't necessarily the one you should be using in order to frame all these type of questions of closeness, uh, you know, it's like optimal, uh, you know, transport from one location to the other, okay? So, um, so in that sense, then it's, it's uh, um, interesting to ask, well, is there a way to look at, um, shall we say, endowing, it's like this space of probability distributions with some sort of geometric structure, which is independent of the choice of representation. Okay, so, uh, so that leads to sort of uh, stuff which you see in Riemannian geometry, like the notion of the metric, uh, affine connections and curvature. And those things turn out to be uh, related to various statistical questions like asymptotic efficiency of uh, maximum likelihood estimators. Okay, all right. So, so that's a very quick introduction to information geometry. I'll come back in a little bit. Uh, and the next thing is uh, machine learning, which obviously is a huge buzzword these days. Everybody, it's like as suddenly we rediscovered that all the mathematics they've done, it's like, you know, in the last decade is now machine learning or big data or something to that effect, okay? And, and I guess I'm no different. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, so some machine learning algorithms can be viewed abstractly as an optimization problem, right? Where you want to find a distinguished element of some parametric family of distributions that minimizes some mismatch with the data, okay? So one way to measure sort of uh, this notion of distance, uh, which is very commonly used these days is what's called a divergence or a contrast function. Uh, and so this is not uh, a metric, all right? Uh, so it's a distance function, but it's somehow asymmetric. So it matters whether going from A to B is different from going from B to A in terms of this notion of distance, if you will, okay? But anyway, it's like, it's, it's a nice mathematical concept. It's like it provides a unified way of measuring things like information, energy, and entropy. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about it and I'll say how somehow these things are connected uh, to discrete mechanics and geometry. Okay, and one of the things which is nice about these divergence functions is that they induce 
Riemannian metrics, they infuse connections. So connections are a way of describing what it means to take um, a vector and parallel transport it, right? So, you know, when I give you the example of the cat, it's like, you know, and actually the transport of the tangent uh, vector, it's like on the sphere, that's an example of parallel transport, right? It's a way to generalize notions of <coughs> straight lines, right? I mean, the two notions of straight lines, one which uh, involves trying to minimize the distance, it's like between two points, and the other one with the idea that moving in a straight line means you don't change your direction. Okay, so what it means to say that I don't change my direction involves this notion of a connection. Okay, so anyway, so these differential geometric structures yield a more natural uh, sort of optimization algorithm, which respects the geometry of the system uh, much more naturally uh, than if you were to use the induced geometry, it's like which comes from this parametric representation of, of the spaces. Okay, <laughs> and then finally, it's like um, what I primarily work on is what's called discrete mechanics. Um, and the way to think about discrete mechanics is that it's a way to construct these geometric structure preserving integrators, uh, primarily for Lagrangian and, uh, and Hamiltonian uh, mechanics. And it's based on the discrete variational principle. So I'll say what all this means later. Um, but how this is connected to the stuff which we recently talked about is that it turns out that this divergence function in information geometry has an interpretation in terms of what is called a discrete Lagrangian, which is a generating function of the symplectic map. Okay. And there's also, this allows you to then impart a nice mechanical interpretation of uh, a certain class of machine learning algorithms, and then to view this as um, associated with continuous mechanical systems. So this is an attempt to address this question with us, uh, which I'd stated, which is to combine the information theoretic optimization problem with the mechanical optimization problem and put them on equal footing. Mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> so now let me uh, say a little bit about what divergence functions are. As I said, these are sort of asymmetric notions of distance between two probability distributions. Um, so you have, uh, you know, it's like two probability distributions and it gives you some non-zero real valued number. And it's, uh, you know, it's like it has some regularity and it satisfies a bunch of uh, conditions. Um, and let me just say sort of briefly a bit of the notation. The D sub I just means I'm differentiating respect to the i component of the first uh, slot. I mean, it's like, so D depends on X and Y. So I'm differentiating respect to the i component of X here. And then D comma uh, I is differentiating respect to the i component, the Y component, right? So anyway, um, so it satisfies some sort of uh, conditions here, um, which may or may not matter to you. And um, so the, the upshot of this is that it's a pseudo distance uh, function. It's non-negative, but it doesn't have asymmetric. Um, and it induces a bunch of geometric structures um, <coughs> like the Riemannian metric. So if you take the derivative respect to the i uh, component of the first variable and the j component of the second variable and you evaluate it along the diagonal, where x is equal to y, then you get uh, entries of a uh, symmetric matrix, okay? Uh, well, minus of that, it gives you uh, sort of entries of a symmetric matrix, symmetric positive definite matrix, okay? So that gives you a, uh, an ex what is known as a metric. It's a way to, you know, do things like inner products, distances, and so on. And then it's like, uh, you know, these other sort of mixed derivatives when evaluated along the diagonal, if you what are called the uh, <coughs> sort of the uh, connection coefficients, right? It tells you again, how do you, what does it mean to take a vector at one point and say that it's the same vector at a different point? Okay, so that's the essential idea. All right, um, and these things are torsion free and they're dual respect to this induced metric. What I mean by that? So I sort of alluded to this idea that what connections do is that it allows you to parallel transport a vector along a path, okay? So it gives you some notion of saying, if I have a vector and I have a path which starts at the initial point, then I want to move this vector without changing direction along that path. So this is what is called parallel transport, okay? So normally if you have a uh, sort of uh, a connection which is compatible with the, uh, the metric, then um, what happens is that if you take two vectors and you were to parallel transport that along a curve, then the Riemannian inner product between that, vector, that pair of vectors stays constant along that parallel transport, okay? 
So, so that's not what happens here. For one thing, you have two connections, a primal and a dual connection, okay? So what happens if you take one vector, you parallel transport it with the first connection, and you take the second vector and you parallel transport it with the second connection, then that inner product of those two parallel transported vectors uh, is constant, okay? So that's, that's what is meant by it being dual with respect to the metric. Okay, anyway, so, um, so if, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, Riemannian geometry, it's like then you've heard of the, you know, it's like the metric compatible connection, which is the levy chibita connection, okay? And, and these things turn out to be uh, related to the levy chibita connection. It's like, um, by the offset, it's like by this uh, sort of uh, symmetric covariant tensor, which is a skewness tensor, measures the extent to which uh, it deviates from this levy chibita connection. Okay, and obviously if T is zero, then uh, you know, it's like you have that these pair of dual connections is actually just the Libby treated connection and they're, they're self, uh, self adjoint in some sense, okay? All right, anyhow, so where are we going off all of this, all right? So, so let's look at uh, what's called the Bregman divergence. So these are class of divergence functions, which are very popular and they're popular because they can be defined just by choosing a convex function, okay? Uh, and if you look at that expression, what that expression is basically just saying is the following. You have a convex function, you have two points, that's like which you want to evaluate two different things basically. So on one hand, you want to evaluate the convex function at one of the points, and you want to evaluate the linear approximation of the, the convex function at a second point at, at the first. Um, so, okay, so, so you evaluate the function at one point, and you also evaluate the linear approximation expanded about the second point at the first point. And you look at the difference between those two things. And this is what is called the, this is what the Bregman divergence does, right? Given a convex function and given two points, okay? All right. So, so if you've done any machine learning, it's like then you might've heard of what is called the kohlblatt leibler uh, sort of uh, divergence. And the KL divergence is an example of a Bregman divergence where the convex functional, or the convex function, which it's defined with respect to is the negative, uh, excuse me, it's the negative Shannon entropy. Uh, and then I also said that given the divergence function, there's an associated Riemannian metric to this. And so the associated Riemannian metric to the KL divergence is the fischer rao metric, okay? So all these things are very, very nicely connected to each other. Um, <clears throat> so, all right. So what I'm going to state later is that these Bregman divergences have an interpretation in terms of discrete mechanics. Okay, so, so just keep that in mind. It's like, as we uh, spend a little bit of time talking about discrete mechanics. Okay, so, um, so you know, earlier we had sort of talked about this idea of geometric invariance, why they're important, it's like in dynamical systems. Um, and so this um, field of geometric integration is aimed at trying to construct numerical methods which preserve those geometric invariants. And as I said before, the reason why that's important is because you know, if you have a geometric invariant that basically constrains the dynamics. That means that the dynamics of the system have to evolve on level sets of the invariant in some appropriate sense, right? So, um, so if you have a numerical method, it's like which respects those invariants, then you're guaranteed to stay it's like on those uh, sort of, you know, level sets as well. So, so that immediately, it's like gives you oftentimes um, much better, it's like uh, qualitative agreement with the physics of the problem, uh, even when you're simulating this for very, very long times, okay? All right, so, so let me say a little bit about how you go about constructing one class of geometric integrators, and these are what are called variational integrators. Um, so this diagram on the left is uh, a model of what's called uh, Hamilton's principle. So Hamilton's principle is a way of describing mechanics without using coordinates, okay? So how do I go about doing that? So imagine I have one point on a manifold and another point on a manifold, okay? Or curve space if you prefer, okay? And I want to describe, it's like the trajectory which takes you from one point to the other, okay? So the way you do this is you write down what's called the action integral. It's the integral of kinetic minus potential energy. And I want to look at um, how that action integral changes as I vary the curves which start at the first point and end the second point. And it turns out that the path which the system actually takes is the, the path for which this action integral is stationary respect to variations in the curve. So that's a fancy way of saying that if I take this curve 
and which the system actually takes, I evaluate this action integral, and I were to perturb that curve slightly while keeping the endpoints fixed, that action integral doesn't change to first order in the variation of the curve, okay? Um, so anyway, so, so if, you've, if you've taken a, a mechanics class, it's like then this leads to what are called the all Lagrange equations, which actually describe what equations that thing satisfies. So you can ask, well, how do I go about discretizing something like this? So one way to go about discretizing this is to take that curve and model it as a set of points, right? Uh, so you sample that curve at a set of discrete times. And then you can ask, well, how do I actually figure out what those points are? So one thing you can do is to say, well, I'm gonna introduce what is called a discrete Lagrangian, which is an approximation of this action integral, but instead of over the entire curve, I'm going to approximate it uh, over just a short step between the first point and the second point, okay? And, um, and if you can sum it up, it's like, and you can um, construct a discrete action sum, um, you can figure out what those internal points are by requiring that this discrete action sum is stationary with respect to moving those points that's like on the discrete curve. So that's a discrete version of Hamilton's principle, okay? Um, I should say that, uh, you know, the question you should be asking yourself is, well, how do I construct a good approximation of this, uh, you know, it's like discrete Lagrangian, and what is it actually trying to approximate, okay? So what it's trying to approximate is what's called the uh, exact discrete Lagrangian, which is right here. And it's basically just the action integral over the short time interval, where the initial point is the first point and the final point is the second point, and the curve itself satisfies the all Lagrange equations, okay? So if you could compute that and evaluate that, then you get what is called the, the exact discrete Lagrangian. And if you were to take that and plug it into the discrete all Lagrange equations, you get an exact sampling of the true trajectory. So what's the catch, right? The catch, of course, is that in order to evaluate the exact discrete Lagrangian, you needed to solve the all Lagrange equations. So you need to know the solution to begin with in order to construct this object. So, you know, it's like, it's one of those mathematical statements, which is technically true, but not very, very useful, right? But nevertheless, it's like knowing this characterization of the exact discrete Lagrangian allows me to construct arbitrarily accurate approximations. So, so you know, it's like, so it's not entirely useless, but, um, you know, it's like, uh, you have to be careful, you know, get a useful method out of this. All right. So anyway, so, so this is uh, stating in equations, what I said in words earlier, you take this, discrete Lagrangian, which is a small piece of the action integral, I sum it over the entire set of uh, discrete points, that gives me a discrete action sum. I want that that discrete action sum, sum is uh, stationary respect to variations of the discrete curve, which keep the final, the initial and final point fixed, right? So that's the natural discrete analog of the, uh, of Hamilton's principle, okay? And when you do that, you end up getting what is called the discrete all Lagrange equations, where D1 here just means differentiating respect to the first variable, and D2 means differentiating respect to the second variable, okay? So, so that's uh, uh, in the language of numerical methods is a second order method. It takes pairs of points, maps it to pairs of points, okay? So um, if you don't like, you know, it's like uh, sort of, sorry, not second order, method, two-step methods, okay? So um, so if you don't like uh, two-step methods, it's like you can write it as a one-step method um, by introducing uh, momentum to it. So you can introduce momentum in this way. And then if you know something about uh, symplectic maps, this is really just saying that this map from uh, position, sorry, this map from position of momentum to the new position and new momentum is really just a symplectic map expressed in terms of a type one generating function. So the discrete Lagrangian is really nothing more than a type one generating function, okay? All right, so, so you might ask, well, what is the benefit of trying to construct numerical methods in this you know, seemingly abstract way? Um, and one of the benefits of going through the discrete Lagrangian is it allows you to do a whole bunch of analysis of the properties of the numerical method with this object instead. So what's the benefit of doing the analysis in terms of that object? That's a scalar valued function. So it's, it's actually much easier to analyze. So one example of you know, being able to say something about the quality or the properties of the numerical method in terms of this discrete Lagrangian is this uh, discrete analog of Nofis theorem. So Nofis theorem mechanics is this, you know, sort of intimate relationship between symmetries of the problem with conservation laws of the problem. 
So if there's a symmetry, there's an associated conservation law. So there's a conservation momentum, which comes from this. Okay, so there's a discrete version of this. So if the uh, discrete Lagrangian, which you have there, right, uh, has the property that you take this pair, you evaluate the discrete Lagrangian at pair points, and say you rotate both the initial and final point by a rotation matrix, okay, and that discrete Lagrangian doesn't change value when you evaluate it on that rotated pair, then what basically means is that that discrete Lagrangian is invariant under that rotation action, okay? So if, if that's true, then there's an associated momentum map, um, which is preserved by the flow. And so uh, if you know, it turned out that your discrete Lagrangian was rotationally invariant, for example, there's a discrete version of angular momentum, which is preserved by the flow as well, okay? So the other thing it's like, uh, which is useful is that you can analyze things like the order of accuracy of a numerical method. So what the order of accuracy basically means is that if you take the time step parameter, right, going from one point to the other, and you reduce the size of that time step, you can ask how much does the error change, right? So a first order method, when you half the time step, the error halves as well. The second order method, when you half the time step, you get half to the second power. So, so the uh, error is like decreases by a factor of four, right? So intuitively, it's oftentimes the case that you might want to have higher order, at least if you can you know, implement them in an efficient way. So in the context of variational integrators, what happens is that you can analyze the order of accuracy of the method by looking at the extent to which the discrete Lagrangian, which you have, approximates the exact discrete Lagrangian, which I talked about before. So if this discrete Lagrangian is exact discrete Lagrangian, um, have an error, which is uh, you know, some constant times h2 the r plus one power, then this uh, numerical method, this variation integrator you get from that is going to be r order accurate, okay? So instead of analyzing the full meta itself, all you have to do is analyze uh, the properties of the scalar value function. So much easier oftentimes. All right, so in any case, it's like, you know, these type of ideas is like have been applied to a bunch of uh, engineering type problems. It's like, so it's applied to uh, sort of various multi-body systems. Uh, it's been applied to, uh, you know, models of uh, biomechanical uh, grasping. So, um, you know, things like, um, um, so Todd Murphy in particular, it's like was at Northwestern has worked with the uh, Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. It's like in order to develop variational integrators uh, for modeling things like human prosthetics. Um, and then it's like uh, Ethan Greenspan, who actually seems, to, I think I have moved. Um, I think he's in Toronto now, somewhere in Canada, I think. Um, um, so, so he's applied these things to continuum mechanics problems. All right, so, um, so that gets, gives you a flavor for uh, geometric integration. Uh, now let me say something about uh, adjoint sensitivity, okay? so. So you might ask, well, okay, geometric methods, great. It's like, so what happens if I look at problems which are not geometric, right? What good uh, do they have? It's like, uh, you know, in such systems. So uh, one thing which is of, of great importance, it's like in many applications, is this idea of sensitivity analysis. Um, and so the claim is that even if you have a system of differential equations, which is not variational, not Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, um, the adjoint system which comes out of it uh, is Hamiltonian, okay? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and more importantly, uh, these symplectic discretizations uh, turn out to be important when you're trying to simulate the adjoint sensitivity of these problems, uh, because what essentially happens is that if you take a dynamical system and you discretize it and then take the adjoint, that in general is different from first taking the adjoint and then discretizing, okay? Where that diagram commutes, where, you know, discretizing and then taking adjoints is equivalent to taking adjoints and discretizing is when you use a symplectic discretization of the adjoint system. So one way to sort of think about this is that the adjoint system is Hamiltonian because it's the cotangent lift of the original dynamical system. So, so there is some sort of geometric structure associated with the adjoint system, even if the original dynamical system is, is not Hamiltonian, okay? Um, and then, um, so these ideas have been used, it's like to do training on what are called neuro ODEs. So there's been recent interest in looking at neural networks which arise from time discretizations of a differential equation. So you have a neuro ODE, time discretization gives you a neural network, 
right? And then you want to take the adjoint, which is essentially back propagation, or well, back propagation is essentially it's like taking the adjoint system, and uh, and you want to you know you want to train it's like that um, deep neural network. Okay, so instead of doing you know discretize and taking the adjoint, you can first take the adjoint of the continuous neural ODE and then discretize it with a symplectic integrator. So this is something which is done. Uh, um, it's like in this reference four here. And then one of the things which we've done uh, so along those lines is to uh, generalize this result to index one differential algebraic equations. So this uh, differential equations with algebraic constraints on them as well. Okay, so anyhow. Um, so let me sort of say a little bit more about how do you actually construct uh, in a computable way, it's like these type of discrete Lagrangians. Okay, so, um, so you have this exact discrete Lagrangian, um, and this is just a way to recharacterize the exact discrete Lagrangian, where instead of writing it as uh, the action integral evaluated along some curve which satisfies the all Lagrange equations and their boundary conditions, I say that I extremize this action integral over curves which are sufficiently differentiable and satisfy the boundary conditions. So the advantage of looking at it this way is that it naturally leads to discretizations uh, where you take the uh, family of curves and replace it with say polynomials of a certain degree and replace the action integral and replace it with a quadrature rule. Okay, so when you do those two approximations, you then construct a method that's like which you can compute. Okay, all right. So, so as before, it's like, you know, if you are willing to construct methods in this way, there are a bunch of meta theorems which allow you to say something about properties of those systems uh, based on properties of the ingredients you put into it. Two ingredients are the quadrature rule and the function space. Okay, so the first one is that if this function space you choose is what is called group equivariant, which is a fancy way of saying that say I have a bunch of control points and I have a curve which is associated with that control point to this fine element space. And then I take all these control points and I rotate all of them by the same rotation matrix. And I look at the curve associated with that. If those two curves are related by the rotation. Then that function space which are constructed is group equivariant, which more or less says that if I transform the parameters and then look at the associated function, that's, um, you know, it's like that function is uh, going to be the original function associated with the original data transformed by the same transformation, okay? All right, so if you, you have, you know, spaces which are uh, like that, it's like then uh, the discrete Lagrangian which you get is going to be group invariant in the sense which we talked about before. As a consequence, it's going to, it's going to preserve a, a discrete momentum map, okay? Uh, and then the other thing is that um, there is this function space which I chose, right? Some finite dimensional function space. And associated finite dimensional function spaces is this notion of best approximation error. So if you're trying to approximate some sort of solution of a differential equation, you can ask, you know, over the space of, I mean, over the set of functions in this finite dimensional space, is there one which minimizes the error between the solution and, and you know, it's like the approximations which I use, okay? And if you have a good numerical method, then the error which you get should be related, um, should be bounded from above by some constant multiple of this best approximation error, okay? So, uh, and it turns out that uh, the methods which we have, it's like have this property. Uh, and, and the reason why that is useful when you try to construct numerical methods is because it changes the problem of, you know, it's like designing a good method to one where you just try to find the, the right approximation spaces to work with. So, um, for example, if you've ever worked with, uh, you know, it's like uh, spectral methods, right, then, um, you know, the rate at which spectral methods as I converge to the exact solution have to do with the fact that if you take a real analytic function and you look at the, um, you know, it's like this sort of Fourier approximation of it, the error, it's like decays, it's like at this exponentially fast rate, right? So, you know, again, if, you, so what that basically does is that if you can do some sort of analysis of the regularity of the solutions, you do some a priori analysis of the regularity of the solutions, then you can leverage that knowledge. It's like uh, together with approximation theory to choose the right spaces which will approximate the solutions as fast as possible, and then construct a method that way. Okay. All right. So so now let me try to connect all of that to information geometry. Okay. 
So I, I talked about this uh, idea of a exact discrete Lagrangian, it's like and symplectic maps and stuff like that. Also sort of briefly talked about, uh, you know, it's like um, divergence functions, okay? So, um, so you have a divergence function and my claim is that you can think of a divergence function, which is scalar value function at two points on a manifold, right? As a generating function and in particular as a discrete Lagrangian. So you might ask, how are all these things related to each other, right? Um, and they're related in the following way. So I said that given say the KL divergence, it is induces the um, fischer rao it's like metric on probability distributions, okay? Um, so you can ask the following question. If I take the KL divergence, think of it as a generating function for a symplectic map, right? This gives me a, a discrete map, okay? And I want to compare that to the time H flow of the geodesic equations uh, associated with fischer rao metric, okay? KL divergence induces fischer rao metric. I can look at sort of the geodesics, it's like off that flow, and I want to flow along a geodesic by time H. So how's that related to the map, okay? So what this result is like by Jin Zhang and I basically says is that, you know, with this type of scaling of the divergence function to give you a time scale to the problem, right? Then um, basically what happens is that the exact discrete Lagrangian for the um, geodesic flow is related to the divergence function with an error up to big O of H cubed. So what that's basically telling you, not so many words, is that if I were to use the KL divergence and use that to generate a symplectic map, that's going to be a second order accurate approximation of the geodesic flow associated with fischer rao okay? So, so that sort of gives you a way of avoiding trying to solve the geodesic equations directly and just use the KL divergence as if it was a generating function. Um, and um, it's always true that, you know, so, so this is true, it's like, um, so the theorem as stated is that this is true for a Bregman divergence, okay? So it's also true for general divergences, but then the error is, is it's uh, lower. I mean, it's like, well, higher. Um, well, sorry, the error is, is big O of H squared. So, uh, so basically it's all, um, the map which you get, it's always at least first order accurate. And if it's a Bregman divergence, then it's second order accurate, okay? So, and again, because KL is a Bregman divergence, that means that it induces the second order accurate approximation of the geodesic flow. Okay, all right. So that's one way of looking at this. And the other way you can ask yourself uh, um, a natural question is the following. Right, so I said that given the divergence function, I can induce a metric and I can induce a pair of connections, okay? So you can ask the inverse question, which is given a divergence function and a pair of connections, right? Can I construct a um, divergence function? So this is the idea of canonical divergences. So it turns out that, you know, these kind of mechanical ideas uh, shows up again, okay? So there's this result, it's like from 2017, which says that if I consider a Lagrangian of the following form, so there's this kinetic energy part, which is, you know, metric times velocity, contracted to velocities. And then there's this sort of um, cubic term, it's like, which involves this unis tensor, which I said is the extent to which the, um, um, the divergences, the pair of, uh, sorry, the connections, the pair of dual connections deviates from the levy tributa connection, okay? So if you write down this Lagrangian and you construct Jacobi's solution, which you can do using this variational integrator construction, which I talked about before, then you can construct one of these canonical divergences. Uh, it's not unique, but I mean, it's like, um, anyway, yeah, so you can do that. So, all right, so, so let me sort of say, you know, how do you connect this with data? Okay, so the basic idea then is that if, you, if you're doing some sort of variational, it's like, um, you know, it's like learning, then what you want to do is you want to take this model distribution and you want to take samples from the actual space. And what well, the first thing you want to do obviously is you want to minimize the mismatch between it's like the samples, it's like and your model, right? So, so another way of saying this is that the uh, loss function is something like the divergence um, between the you know, internal representation and, and, and the data. And then um, because you don't want this sort of estimator it's like to change too fast, what you want to do then is you want to add a momentum term. And the way you can add a momentum term is to look at the divergence. It's like between 
the current state and the new state, okay? And so you can end up with a discrete Lagrangian of this form um, to, to allow you to do something like this, okay? And, and the claim then is that, you know, that allows you to put everything now uh, in discrete time, right? So, um, so you know, you can either do everything in discrete time or everything in continuous time. Uh, I've talked about how you can make mechanics. It's like going to discrete time. So that together with this then allows you to also put the information theoretic aspect of the problem in discrete time. Conversely, you can look at this problem and then look at the continuum limit to put everything in continuous time, okay? All right, so in the remaining five minutes, I guess, <laughs> Um, I will very quickly talk about uh, the applications to optimization. Um, so, all right, so optimization, as you might expect, is like involves trying to minimize some sort of function. Um, and, you know, it's like, you probably heard of things like the gradient descent method, where you sort of, you know, go in the gradient direction, okay? And the problem, if you will, with gradient descent methods are that in general, they converge at big O one over K, where K is the number of iterations. Um, so what happened back in the 80s was that Nesterov introduced what is called the accelerated gradient method, which is written here, okay? And the main, it's like claim to fame, it's like of the accelerated gradient method is that it converges at big O one over K squared. So it converges much faster. It's like then sort of vanilla um, sort of gradient methods. And then in addition to that, uh, Nesterov proved that a barrier here much more or less says that, you know, um, when you look at certain classes of algorithms, this big O one over K squared rate is optimal, okay? So, so it was a very mysterious method. It's like, and there was a lot of interest in trying to understand where does acceleration come from? Can you construct methods which also exhibit acceleration? So one uh, sort of path towards that uh, was work by uh, Sue Boyd and Candes. Um, it's like back in 2016, which looks at the continuous time limit of the Nesterov algorithm, all right? So the idea is that, okay, there's a limit of this algorithm to a differential equation. Can I then use numerical ODE techniques to discretize that to construct new algorithms? So that was sort of the idea behind all of this, okay? And in addition to that, uh, the group around Michael Jordan at Berkeley uh, introduced um, sort of what are called the Bregman Lagrangians and Bregman Hamiltonians, right? So these are Lagrangian Hamiltonian descriptions of flows whose continuous time solutions converge to the minimizer at uh, at a very fast rate. Uh, so big O of uh, one over T to the P for any P. Um, and they're related. I mean, it's like the construction actually uses uh, these Bregman divergences, all right? And if you look at it, it has sort of the form, which is similar to the thing which I talked about before, where you have terms, it's like, which uh, involve the potential or the cost function, uh, which is a little bit like that you know, mismatch term, which I talked about before. And then you have a momentum term, which involves the divergence function evaluated on two nearby points, uh, you know, in the solution, right? So, so it has a very similar flavor. It's like to this discrete uh, Lagrangian, which I've written down before as a model for uh, using discrete mechanics to do uh, machine learning. Okay, so anyway, it's like, so you can choose these. So there's some growth conditions. It's like which alpha, beta and gamma have to satisfy. Uh, and if, if that happens, it's like, then you have this rate of decay, it's like of the continuous solution. And in particular, the part which most people are interested in is when you choose alpha, beta, and gamma uh, in this way involving Ps, and then the Lagrange flow, it's like of that converges to big O, uh, at a rate of big O of one over T to the P. So, um, so, yeah. So anyway, so we were able to develop, it's like a variational discretization of this. Um, it involves what is called a Poincaré transformation, which I don't really have time to explain. More or less, it's like you do some sort of time rescaling, you transform the Hamiltonian into a new form, um, and then you can apply your integrators to that. And the reason why you sort of needed to do that was because it's a time dependent problem and most numerical integrators for Hamiltonian systems uh, have nice properties when you have time independent problems. So as you probably learned from dynamical uh, sort of your uh, you know, it's like your freshman ODE class, right? One way of dealing with non-autonomous systems is to make it autonomous by adding time that's like into the variables. So you go into extended phase space uh, and, and more or less it's like this Poincaré transformation allows you to do that on simple things. Um, so I will skip through all this and say that it involves um, the construction of Hamiltonian variational integrators, okay? Uh, and, and there's, uh, you know, there's a nice way of doing this, which I don't have time to explain. Um, but let me just sort of show you, it's like the results, right? Um, so, so here it's like you have a plot of 
um, you know, it's like the adaptive and direct methods. So the upshot is that you can, um, these family of Bregman, Lagrange, and Hamiltonians, which are parameterized by P, all related by some sort of time uh, rescaling. So you can use the time rescaling to construct uh, faster methods. And, and that's sort of essentially the upshot here, that if you let P be larger and larger, because of the fact that the continuous flow converges one over T to the P, you expect that the numerical method, which comes out of that, converges faster as well. And that's what you see in this plot, okay? Uh, you can compare these things to non-symplectic methods, but which are time adaptive. And you basically what you find is that the uh, non-symplectic adaptive uh, uh, sort of Runge-Kutta methods uh, don't really benefit from this rescaling, it's like phenomena. Um, and, and I should say that, you know, using adaptive methods, it's like to do this calculation is extremely expensive because when you try to find the right time step, you spend a lot of time, um, you know, it's like basically evaluating different time steps in order to estimate the error. Um, but because the actual dynamics already has a very sort of defined scaling, you can just build that into the method and it becomes a lot faster, okay? And, um, and this method is also much faster than the Nesterov accelerated gradient method. Uh, so the red line is the Nesterov method and the blue line is our method, so it converges faster, uh, at least if you want smaller, okay? All right, and you can extend this to Riemannian manifolds, um, uh, which is given there. I'm not really gonna spend too much time about it. And, and this is just some simulations which demonstrate that you can actually use those generalizations to Riemannian manifolds to then construct uh, algorithms for optimization on Riemannian manifolds as well. Um, and you can apply this to uh, pose estimation. It's like, uh, if you're trying to figure out, you know, based on um, basically samples, it's like of the environment, what direction your camera is pointing at. It's like based on some sort of uh, mismatch uh, minimization. And uh, so let me just say in the last, negative two minutes, right? Um, that uh, we have generalized, it's like um, variational integrators to collisions involving Lie groups. Um, and, and the reason why I think that's interesting is because we're using this as a method to deal with optimization problems with uh, inequality constraints. So imagine that you have an optimization problem, but you have a region which you want to avoid, okay? And so what the upshot of what we've been saying so far is that you can think of optimization problems uh, or these methods for that as flows of dynamical systems and their associated discretizations. If you take that point of view, then you can think about obstacle avoidance as being collisions of an obstacle set. Okay, so that's basically what's happening. Uh, and, and this is in collaboration with Qualcomm. Uh, so if you have an Android phone um, and it has a Snapdragon, it's like a chip, that's, that's the company which developed these things. Um, and so we're interested in applying these methods to constraint optimization of the outside chip design. So let me just sort of finish by saying, giving you this little simulation of, uh, you know, collision integrators. It's like on the spatial rotations um, with this cube. So the thing about the cube is that it's sharp corners. All right. And so there's a, a novel regularization, which we use. And you'll see that the first couple of bounces, those two cubes are right on top of each other. And, and towards the end, you'll see that they separate, okay? So this regularization allows you to recover this sensitive dependence of initial conditions when the two cubes, so I should say the two cubes started off at almost the same initial condition, but very slightly offset from each other, okay? And so you see that for the first six bounces, they look right on top of each other, right? But after that, it's like that small difference in the initial condition amplifies and then you start seeing the trajectories diverge, okay? So there's no, unlike most methods involving sharp interfaces, there is no randomization of this. If you keep running it or keep giving you the same result, there's no random number generator involved there. So it's deterministic, but still manifests this extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, okay? So um, anyhow, so let me sort of summarize by saying that um, information geometry provides a differential geometric interpretation of some machine learning algorithms. And the divergence function in particular induces differential geometric uh, structures on the space of statistical manifolds uh, and is related in some interesting ways uh, to discrete Lagrangians and mechanics. Um, that machine learning optimization algorithms are related to these discrete mechanical systems on the space of probability distributions. 
uh, and that these accelerated optimization algorithms, uh, which are based on the Brecton, the Grangian, and the Hamiltonian, um, and their geometric discretizations uh, can be constructed using these time adaptive Hamiltonian variational integrators. And the goal of all of this basically is to leverage this analogy between mechanics, uh, learning, optimization, and optimal control uh, to basically you know, export the techniques of geometric numerical integration to obtain interesting new classes of algorithms. Okay, and with that, let me just uh, end.